Last weekend, Pastor Henry gave his annual vision address. And if you were not able to hear it, I'd encourage you to go to our website and watch that sermon or on our YouTube channel. Uh, Pastor Henry reminded us from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. When we respond to God's leading in faith and obedience and step out to do the seemingly impossible, God is pleased because our faith in Him will grow and our friendship with Him will deepen. We believe God has called us as a church to devote ourselves to the following biblical pursuits. When Jesus comes back again, we want Him finding us pursuing Him first and foremost, pursuing disciple-making relationships, pursuing mission, pursuing generosity, and pursuing simplicity. Pastor Henry challenged us to keep growing in our faith by seeking the Lord in prayer and using the stepping out in faith handout that was uh, given to you last weekend, uh, which has uh, a faith goal attached to each one of our pursuits. Now, here's the difference between a goal and a faith goal. A goal is something you're committed to doing in your own strength. And a faith goal is something you are trusting God to accomplish through you by His strength and power. Now, when we establish faith goals, we are saying, God, despite the uh, discouraging circumstances that are surrounding us, I believe you are at work. And therefore, I'm not content with the victories of the past. I'm not content with the status quo. I want to keep growing in my faith in you, my friendship with you, and be used by you to fulfill your kingdom purposes. In these crazy days, in the midst of all the doom and gloom that's surrounding us, we as the people of God are living for a different cause. And I don't know about you, that really excites me. And so if you haven't prayerfully completed the a faith goal discernment process and filled out this stepping out in faith card, I would encourage you to do so as soon as possible. We want you to complete two cards, keeping one as a visible reminder for you and you can return the other anonymously to your campuses as a tangible expression to the Lord of uh, the faith goals that you've come up with. Uh, you can do this online as well by uh, clicking the link we have on our website, uh, cschurch.ca slash faith. And one of our pursuits as a church is the pursuit of generosity. Second Corinthians chapter 8 verse 7 says, but since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. If we are going to accomplish the mission that God has for us as a church, it will require that we all grow in the grace of giving, the giving of our time, our talents and spiritual gifts, and our financial resources. Now, we celebrate how God has used our collective faith in the past year to see hundreds come to faith, to see hundreds of people, their needs being met in our city, as well as completing the Bearspa campus building and making significant progress in our addition here at Center Campus. Now, to God be the glory for all that has been accomplished so far. But we know our mission is not complete. There are thousands in our city who still need to hear about Jesus. Our Build More Room for God project still has ways to go. And the build update that we just heard in the video clearly spells out the remaining finances we need to complete the project. So we appeal to you to go to God and ask Him what He wants you to give towards the mission and ministry budget and also to our build project so that through our generosity, this generation and the generations coming behind us will have the means and the tools that they need to reach the world for Christ. So God bless you as you step out and grow in the grace of giving. Now, would you pray with me now as we launch into the message for today? Father, we 
Thank you that you've called us in, on a faith adventure. That you don't want us to maintain the status quo or just rest in the laurels of the past. But you want us to be forward thinking. So Lord, by faith, we believe in your promises that you want to use us as a church to advance your kingdom. So help us, Lord, we pray, to partner with you in the great work that you are doing. And even today, as we prepare our hearts to hear from you, we pray that you will speak to us, encourage us, affirm us, and challenge us, that our faith will grow stronger, that our walk with you will deepen, and we will be able to bring glory and honor to you. We pray this in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to welcome all of us at Center Street Church, those of us here at Center Campus, as well as those joining us from our campus in Bearspa, Bridgeland, Airdrie, and South Calgary. I also want to welcome our online viewers as well. And today we're going back to the sermon series, Fruitful. And in this series, we are taking a closer look at the character qualities that are listed in Galatians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul writes in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. The flavors that are listed here in Galatians 5, these are not natural virtues. We cannot produce them on our own. So here's a, a caution for all of us. Now, I don't want any of us to walk away from this sermon series saying, I have to determine myself to be more loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, or kind. And we will fail miserably if we try to bring transformation through our human efforts. The fruit of the Spirit do not represent natural virtues, but they signify the deep work of the Holy Spirit. This is supernatural. This is the evidence of a close walk with Jesus. The fruit is a byproduct of our abiding in Christ. So as we abide in Jesus and as his word abides in us, the Holy Spirit produces the fruit in our lives. This is the process of sanctification whereby we become more and more like Jesus on a daily basis. Now, at the same time, you have to keep in mind, we are not passive in this process. We have a role to play. We do our part in taking the time to abide, to remain in the mind, to stay connected to the source, engage in spiritual practices that keep us in tune with God. So that is our part. And then God does his part of bringing the transformation and changes in our life. Today we're going to look at yet another attribute from our list in Galatians 5. It's faithfulness. I want to talk to you about what faithfulness means in the Christian life. I'll connect this weekend's message with what you heard last weekend from Pastor Henry in his vision address, because they tie in together, and it's a great way to be able to reinforce the direction that we want to go as a church. God wants us to be not only people of faith, but he wants us to be faithful in all areas of our life. If we are to meet the faith goals that we have come up with, it will take faithfulness on our part. It is not about doing this for a short period of time, like a day or a week or a month, but we're talking about the long haul. We are after a lifestyle that pleases God, what Eugene Peterson referred to as a, a long obedience in the same direction. Faithfulness is about being reliable, and trustworthy. It is about staying the course over the long haul, being steady over a period of time. Now, I want to read two sets of scripture passages, one that reflects on the faithfulness of Jesus, and the second set of scripture passage talks about our faithfulness as God's people. 
And towards the end of this message, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Make sure you have the communion elements with you. Our ashes can help you if you need one. And if you're watching us online and want to participate in this experience with us, then have a piece of bread or cracker and some juice ready. And towards the end of this message, we will partake of the elements together. Now, if you're physically able, I'm going to invite you to stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. John chapter 4, verses 34 and 35, and 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You all may be seated. The Leadership Secrets of Billy Graham is a book that gives us a glimpse of the courageous leadership style of the great evangelist and the convictions that undergirded his ministry. Now, the authors of this book talk about the difference between stadium lights and a laser. A stadium light illumines an entire sports field, turning night into day so all the spectators can enjoy the game. But a laser is completely different. It so focuses the power of light that it can cut through. So laser is used to perform surgeries. That is the power of energy that is not just diffused, but is intensely focused. A Billy Graham lived a focused life. He precisely knew God's call for his life and remained faithful until the very end. Throughout his ministry, Billy could have gone in all kinds of directions because offers abounded, from becoming a movie star to a TV show host and even an offer to run for the president of the nation. And as attractive as all these propositions were, Billy refused every one of those to faithfully execute God's will for his life and serve as an evangelist. It is so easy to allow our energy to be diverted in multiple directions. That is a caution for those of us in our day and age, where we can keep ourselves busy doing a whole lot of things and still not accomplish anything of significance. Maintaining focus is the key to faithfulness. Billy Graham learned this principle not from some leadership book, but from the life of Jesus. Jesus is the one who modeled faithfulness for us. Jesus, with a laser-like focus, went about accomplishing his mission without giving in to any distractions. The text that we read from John chapter 4, Jesus was engaging in a conversation with a Samaritan woman by the well. In the midst of a demanding schedule, Jesus had time for a marginalized woman looked down by everybody else in the society. And the Samaritans were despised because they were a mixed breed. And these were Jews who had intermarried with Gentiles and therefore had compromised on their ethnic purity. 
But following the father's leading, Jesus reached out to this woman, and the door opened for many more people in Samaria to come to know the good news through this one encounter. Now, Jesus' disciples were shocked to see him in conversation with the Samaritan woman and breaking all the cultural taboos. But Jesus clearly was in tune with the Father's voice. He received daily directions from him. The Father set the agenda for the day and who he was going to meet, what he was going to do. He was clearly being led by God on a daily basis. So Jesus says to his disciples in John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Doing the will of God is about submitting to his plans, letting God lead the direction in which we are going. Jesus' ultimate joy and satisfaction were in pleasing God the Father. Jesus did not waver. He did not get distracted by anything. He surrendered to the will of the Father, and he stayed the course. Jesus says, my Food is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. Jesus' life was all about completing the task that the Father had specifically given to him. He laser focused all of his efforts and his energy on what God wanted him to do. That is how Jesus demonstrated his faithfulness. John 6, 38, Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. You can't be more crystal clear than that. Jesus never worked independently. Everything that he did was in cooperation with the Father, being led by his voice to fulfill his will. And through his example, Jesus sets a model for us who are his followers. We are no longer on a path that will serve our own purposes or our agenda. But as followers of Christ, we trade our plans for God's and we live to do his will and respond to his bidding. In John chapter 17, verse 4, Jesus prayed, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Now, how did Jesus glorify God? By finishing the work that the Father had assigned for him. And in the same way, we glorify God by completing the unique tasks that he has in store for us. That is success. And not going in a hundred different directions, but being laser focused on the pursuit of God and his priorities for our life. And there's no greater joy than coming to the end of your life and being able to say, I have fulfilled all that God had in mind for my life. And I tell you, there is no greater regret than coming to the end of your life and realizing you still have work left undone. That is the heart behind our faith goals as a church. See, we are not dreaming something crazy or wild and asking God to bless our plans. This is not a number game. This is not about making us look good. We are saying, God, you have a plan for us. You have something that you want to do through Center Street Church. You want to exalt Jesus in our city, in our nation, and around this world. And we want to partner with you. We want to honor you and accomplish all that you have for us. We withhold nothing back and we unreservedly make ourselves available to magnify Jesus. That is the cry of our heart. Now, the Apostle Paul also demonstrated that kind of passion and zeal to accomplish God's purposes for his life. In the text that we read in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 
Paul talks about the critical role of the faithful. The faithful serve as vital links in the chain for the gospel message to transcend from one generation to the next. God works through people who embody the fruit of the Spirit, who demonstrate this character quality of faithfulness. Look at what Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. The word translated reliable is the Greek word pistis, which could also be translated as faith or faithfulness. And it's the same word, it is the context that will tell us whether it's talking about faith or it's talking about faithfulness, and sometimes they can be interchangeable. For instance, Hebrews chapter 11 talks about faith and lists the names of the people of faith. And if you carefully look at the list, you will see these are not just people who had great faith, but these are people who are also faithful. So Hebrews 11 is not just a hall of fame of faith, but it's a hall of fame of the faithful. The people of faith are also faithful. Not only do they have a great amount of faith, but you can place your faith in these people because they are reliable and trustworthy. Their character matches their confession of faith. They are faithful in their commitment to God and executing the things God is asking of them. That is the fruit of the Spirit. The supernatural work of the Spirit producing this character quality in us that signifies our spiritual maturity. So much so... It is the qualification required in the New Testament for church leaders. For anyone to play a leadership role in the church, this is the first thing that is expected of them, that they be faithful. Faithfulness is an essential quality. And the gospel advances through the lives of the faithful. Notice in that one verse in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, we have reference to four generations. Look at this carefully. Paul says, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Four generations represented in this one verse. We have Paul, who is faithful to God's call in his life. We have Timothy, who is faithfully following Jesus and is following the steps of Paul. We have the reliable, faithful people that Timothy is called to minister to. And the faithful, reliable people in turn minister to others and equip them. Four generations are represented in one verse. And all of them possess the same characteristic of faithfulness. Now you tell me, what is the key to reaching the next generation? What do we need for the successful transmission of the gospel from one generation to the next? Now if you're not careful, we can put the spotlight on the wrong things. We can emphasize our creative ideas and strategies, what impressive plans that we can come up with to reach the next generation. We can put the onus on our abilities and talents and our leadership acumen and make them the ultimate thing. But more than gifts, more than talents, more than leadership, more than human creativity, what we need for the gospel to reach one generation to the next is faithful people. For where there is a shortage of faithfulness in the church, we will have a hard time passing the baton of the gospel from one generation to another. Paul goes on to offer three practical illustrations of faithfulness. Now for the sake of time, we'll take a, a brief look at each one of them. Look at 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. 
No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. So here's the first illustration of faithfulness. A soldier, a faithful person is like a soldier. And one of the marks of a soldier is undivided loyalty. When a person is enlisted in the army, they swear an oath of allegiance declaring their unequivocal commitment. A life of a soldier is one of hardships and danger. A soldier on duty is willing to lay aside their personal interests on the side in order to obey the orders from above. And when a soldier is commissioned to go to some place, they don't say, it's too dangerous. Can you please excuse me and, and find somebody else to go? Uh, they don't negotiate with the commanding officer, but I have a young family. I'm worried about my safety. Can you send someone else? Uh, Paul says here, no soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. The word entangled is a reference to something that is braided or weaved together and can trip you and cause you to fall. You can't get entangled as a soldier in your personal affairs for nothing can keep you from fulfilling the orders that you've received from above. Now, In the same way, God wants Christians to live such a life. Don't be so caught up in your everyday affairs that it causes you to compromise your commitment and loyalty to Jesus. You know, as Christians, we don't withdraw from our everyday life, but we don't let our everyday life blur the fact that we are serving Jesus on mission. Faithfulness calls for single-minded, laser-focused devotion. Now, if we are honest, the whole COVID-19 pandemic has become a, a serious distraction for God's people. And all along, that has been the enemy's intent, that we are preoccupied with something, and as a result, we've taken our eyes off Jesus. And we simply cannot let that happen. Never forget that there is a spiritual warfare that's happening all around us. And as followers of Christ, we are called to be on the front lines. So let's serve as good soldiers of Christ Jesus. The second illustration is of an athlete. Paul writes in verse 5, Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. In order to win the crown, the athlete has to be disciplined in every way. They have to play by the rules of the game. They have to adhere to a, a rigorous regime of practices that ensure that they're following all of the rules of the competition. And that is the plain difference between winners and losers, the extent of time spent in preparation. No sports person takes their preparation or their performance lightly. In the same way, the Christian life calls for that kind of Devotion and dedication, and not a casual, laid-back approach to the Christian life, but a, one of commitment and training, being prepared for what God wants to do through us. And here's the difference. The athlete does all of this for a perishable crown, something that will fade away, and no matter how great the accomplishment will be, eventually forgotten. But the greatest praise that awaits us as Christians are the words of affirmation of the Father, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord, and that affirmation will never fade away. Hear me. 
Our eternal rewards are based on our faithfulness in the present. You may not make it to the who's who list of today. You may not be part of the movers and shakers of the society, but if you are faithful, God takes note of who you are, and that is all that matters. So we train ourselves like athletes. Lastly, Paul uses the image of a farmer. Verse 6, he says, the hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crop. A farmer is someone who knows all that it takes to reap the harvest. That the crop will not just walk into the burn. It requires tilling the soil, sowing, watering the seed, protecting them from the elements, and finally working hard to gather the harvest. A successful harvest is contingent upon the cumulative work that has gone preceding the harvest. And all along, the farmer does not see the harvest with their physical eyes. That is entirely an act of faith, trusting in the process that God has put in place in nature. You know, in an age of instant results, This is a powerful analogy. A faithfulness is about working hard and staying the course, even in the long haul, in spite of not seeing immediate results. I think about those who started our church, the small community of people who through their eyes of faith saw the possibility that lay ahead of them and remained faithful to that vision. And they had no idea of what God was going to do through their acts of sacrifices, but they sowed in faith and remained faithful to what God was calling them to do. And God blessed their faithfulness, multiplied their efforts, and we today are the beneficiaries of those sacrifices. Let me ask you, Would that be said of us today? Will our faithfulness be the vital link in the chain for the gospel to transcend from one generation to the next? So the three images of faithfulness spur us in the task that's ahead of us. And even as we look at our faith goals, Look at them through the lens of these three imageries. Engage in it like a soldier with undivided loyalty to Jesus. As an athlete, train yourself for the godly life. And as a farmer, work hard, work diligently for the harvest is at hand. So prayerfully, Take the time to discern if you have not already done it and fill out this stepping out in faith handout. And this faith goals that are listed here tied to our five pursuits as a church, let them shape the direction of your life. Pursue God. How much time you want to spend each day hearing the voice of God through his word and spending time in prayer. Pursue relationship. How many people do you want to be in a discipling relationship with in whom you can invest? Pursue mission. Ask, Lord, by faith, how many people do you want me to share the good news of the gospel? How can I, through my words and my deeds, testify to the saving power of Jesus? Pursue generosity. Ask, Lord, how can I be more generous in the use of my time and resources, my spiritual gifts and talents? How can I be more faithful in giving financially for the advancement of your kingdom? Pursue simplicity. Ask the Lord how you can simplify your life so you have the time and the resources that you need where you can focus on 
things that really matter in light of eternity. Faithfulness is needed on our part in order to leave a lasting legacy behind. And I've talked to us today about the things that we need to do in order to move the mission forward. And in case you feel overwhelmed by all this, you feel like it's too heavy or too much of an ask, I want to encourage you in closing. We don't do all of this in our own strength. We fix our eyes on Jesus as the model of our faithfulness and rely on His Spirit to keep us faithful until the very end. The difference in all of this is Christ in you, His power and strength working through you. So we look to Jesus and follow His lead. And as we heard at the beginning of the message, Jesus said, my food is to do the will of Him who sent me. He again prayed in John 17, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And so Jesus gave his life for us to accomplish the very mission that he came for. What does Jesus say after enduring the agonies of the cross? And Jesus was beaten to a pulp and nails were driven to his hands and feet as he bled and died. These were the final words of Jesus in John 19, 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, what did Jesus mean by this phrase, it is finished? It's what he said earlier in John 4, 34. My food said Jesus is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Uh, having endured the agony of the cross and bearing the cup of God's wrath, Jesus is saying, the work that I came to do is complete. I have fulfilled my obligations. This was not a cry of defeat. This is an emphatic cry of victory, of job complete, of mission accomplished. For Jesus' death perfectly satisfied God's redemptive plan. The price of our sins were paid for in full, and through his sacrifice, Jesus has procured eternal life for all who believe in him. And that is the good news that we celebrate. But we don't stop there. We partner with God in accomplishing his purposes. Commit to the long haul, a lifestyle of faithfulness. So we also can come to the end of our life and we can say, it is finished. The job that God had assigned for me is all done. Now as we transition to celebrating the Lord's Supper, let me remind us, Holy Communion is a means of grace by which Jesus nourishes our soul. The Lord's Supper is not just a memorial, but it is an opportunity for us to commune with Christ in the present. That by faith, we appropriate the benefits of all that Jesus has done for us, and we encounter the living Christ. So if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you have committed your life to him, you believe in him and you're living for him, then I want to invite you to join in this great celebration. Receive the empowerment now of Christ in you, giving you the ability and the strength to do what you cannot do in your own power. But before we do, let's examine our hearts to see if there's anything we need to confess before the Lord, an area of shortcoming or failure, a sin that has somehow sneaked into our life. This is a time for us to make sure our fellowship with Jesus is close and that nothing has come in between. So use this time to prepare our hearts before we partake of the elements. 
So let's maintain a moment of silence to just close our eyes. Lord, we thank you for the faithfulness of Jesus. He is the one who ran the race with perseverance. And he, through his sacrifice, has paid the price for our sins. So we come before your presence today with a clear conscience. The assurance that our sins have been forgiven and washed away as far as the east is from the west. So far you have removed our transgressions. And now you're inviting us, Lord, to living our lives in partnership with you. So as we partake of the elements, we pray that in a fresh new way, we will experience what it means to have Christ in us. The power that he gives us to bring transformation, to bring healing, to work through us to accomplish your will. So nourish our souls, those who are weary, those who feel tired in their Christian life because of all that has happened this year, last year and a half. Lord, we need strength for the journey ahead of us. So would you meet us as we partake of these elements? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now at this time, you can uh, take the elements out. You can unwrap them from the package. And if you're watching us online, uh, you can grab your bread or cracker and some juice so you can partake of this together with us. Let me read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'm going to ask all of us to stand as we partake of this together. The body of Jesus was broken for us on the cross so we can be made whole. Let's partake of this bread with gratitude. The blood of Jesus was shed. Our sin has been defeated. We are forgiven and have been adopted into the family of God. Let's partake of this with gratitude. 